Hi, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mark Abel. As most of you might already have heard, a bit more than a year ago, we started a new a collaborative re research center with Intel here at the University of Washington. This center is called Intel Science and Technology Center for Pervasive Computing. It's funding a large number of students here, both at the University of Washington and at our partner universities. The center is going to run for three to five years. Um, Mark joined us as the Intel co-PI in the spring of this year. Um, uh, Mark is currently uh, affiliate faculty in computer science. He's also still a full-time employee at Intel. He's been at Intel for quite a while. 20 years, wow, and where he was also, he was a lab director, and he has a lot of research background in uh, work that's related to the Pervasive Computing Center because at Intel, he led the efforts in uh, context and sensor-aware computing, and today he'll tell us something about what's going on in the center here. So. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so, hi, everybody. Just to get a sense, uh, Who's here? Who's not here from computer science? Like not a computer science person. Other departments and things. How about industry? Show of hands. Okay. Well, okay. I'm, I'm an industry guy too. So. Uh, first thing I want to say is um, I'd very much like to take questions while we're going along. So feel free. You know, just uh, given the structure of this room, just raise your hand or yell out or something, and uh, I'll try and address them as we go. Um, so as Dieter said, um, we started the center. Uh, here at the University of Washington. It is one of seven centers uh, of this sort that Intel has opened around uh, the United States, and in addition, five more around the rest of the world. And I'll tell you kind of about this model a little bit, just to make clear you know, how we're put together. Uh, talk a little bit about the state of pervasive computing, ubiquitous computing these days, uh, and then kind of focus on the center. And again, really, the, I guess the funding for most of the projects and things kind of kicked in about nine months ago, so we're talking about some work that's over the last nine to 12 months. Uh, and we'll talk about the, the people involved. I think if you came in early enough, you saw uh, some of the students who were, uh, who were included in the funding for the center. Uh, we'll talk about the research and, uh, and then kind of wrap up. And again, please stop me with questions as we go. So uh, Intel has put together this sort of a different model. Some of you may remember there was a, a lablet down the street. Uh, and uh, rather than uh, having uh, Caetano was here, was one of the directors of that, Dieter, uh, and several other professors from here, James Landay, if he's in here. Um, and uh, what we've done is uh, taken the, uh, the resources from those lablets and some other places and created a set of collaborative centers with, uh, like I said, a dozen universities, a dozen, dozen centers around the world in different topics. Uh, and the notion here is uh, that each, each of the centers has a hub. And luckily for all of us, uh, the hub for this center is at the University of Washington. And uh, you'll see in a moment the folks that are, that are involved from the University of Washington. And there's other universities that are involved as well, uh, we call spokes. And another thing that's interesting is that the, the IP from this, this center is public domain. So all this open research, uh, publishable, and, uh, uh, and you know, Intel may get early crack at some of the, the work, but it's going to be open to the industry and to our uh, folks around the industry. And the idea is to kind of create, with either, either take advantage of existing uh, research communities uh, or, or, or in some cases create new research communities. And we're kind of doing both here. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. So again, there are seven centers around the US. Um, uh, there are two at Carnegie Mellon, uh, embedded, embedded computing, cloud computing, uh, big data at MIT, Secure Computing at Berkeley, uh, Social Computing down at UC Irvine, and Visual Computing, that's Pat Hanrahan and, and crew uh, at, uh, at Stanford. And again, these are the hub schools for our seven, the seven centers. So we'll talk a little bit about our center now. We're going to focus on our center the rest of the talk. Um, we'll talk about sort of the people involved, uh, the communities we're kind of pulling together, our mission, our themes, and, uh, and some of the application and driving scenarios that we have. So I don't know if you know Deborah Estrin. Deborah Estrin just moved from the West Coast to the East Coast. Uh, she's one of, the new, one of the founding professors of the Cornell uh, New York campus. Uh, so this is our crew. Uh, so first, uh, the University of Washington, you can see Dieter and uh, a number of other esteemed folks from the university. A lot of them are here. Um, so we have Jeff, Jeff Bilms, uh, uh, James Fogarty, uh, Yoshi Kono, uh, uh, Richard Ladner, uh, Shwetik Patel, Josh Smith, who I saw Josh sitting up here somewhere. Um, 
uh, David Weatherall, who's uh, in sunny, sunny Barcelona on sabbatical, uh, and Luke. And uh, thanks, all of you, for coming, because I'm going to need help on some of your, your, uh, uh, the details of your work that you know, I'm talking about today. Uh, we also have four Intel people who are on site. You folks probably know uh, Anthony Lamarca, who's been around here for many years. Uh, Zhao Feng Ren and Li Feng Bo are, are in the audience here as well, sitting right here. Um, and the four of us sit on campus here. We sit in the computer science building. Uh, thanks, Ed and Hank, for giving us space. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so you can see the center of this, the hub of this center is, is here. Uh, in addition, we have a number of esteemed faculty from elsewhere. Uh, Fei Fei Li is a world class uh, uh, object recognition expert. Um, Henry, Henry Kautz, a lot of you probably know, he used to be a professor here. He's chair of the department at, uh, uh, at Rochester and the outgoing president of AAAI. Um, Tanzim Chaudhry and Deborah Estrin at Cornell uh, are working on our OpenM Health uh, uh, program. And uh, the gentleman at uh, Georgia Tech, uh, Gregory About, is one of the leading lights in ubiquitous computing. And in fact, was Shwetik Patel's uh, PhD thesis advisor. And Jim Ray is another uh, person who does uh, vision and such. Bunch of professors, bunch of students. Uh, we have uh, on the order of uh, 35 students uh, supported by the center. So notice. If you, if you knew about the old Lablet structure, there, instead of there being uh, you know, 15 or 20 Intel people funded, we're funding a, f a handful of Intel people, but a much larger contingent of, of students and professors. Uh, so you can all wave to your friends or say hi to yourself or whatever there. So. Thank you all for coming, by the way. I, I'd introduce you all, but it'd take a while. So we're glad you're here. So um, the state of pervasive computing. So you may remember, uh, well, maybe most of you are probably too young to remember. Those of you who are, you know, have some gray hair. I uh, will remember that uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, Mark Weiser uh, kind of was driving a vision of uh, pervasive computing, ubiquitous computing. And if you haven't read that uh, seminal paper, you should. Uh, he laid out a vision that is kind of, you know, probably a piece of it has, has been realized today with all the smartphones. How many of you have smartphones? Just out of curiosity, show of hands. Is there anybody who does not? I won't ask that question. But, um, but uh, not only in smartphones, but in automobiles, in um, you know, they're sensing, you know, place in the environment. Uh, I spent a lot of the first part of this year in London before I was working with Dieter and, and the crew. And uh, London uh, has, uh, I think there's about as many cameras as there are people in London. And it's, it's one of the most, you know, visually uh, recorded places on Earth. Um, so in any event, you know, I think that this vision is getting close to being uh, realized in its first instantiation, the 1.0, 2.0 kind of, kind of view. But I think what the center's about is where does this stuff go next? And that's what we're going to talk about most of the rest of the talk. Another view of the future of ubiquitous computing and, and pervasive computing uh, was from, we, uh, Ubicomp was in uh, Pittsburgh in September. And so I want you to take a look at, this is a, a word cloud from all the titles of all the talks at Ubicomp, and I want you to kind of see what you, what you notice in looking at this. So I'll give you a second. So what things jump out at you, obviously, users and human activity, and mobile, and understanding, and turning sensing into understanding, and what, what things, anything surprise you there? Kitchen, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of folks, as you'll see, we're also doing work in the kitchen to understand kitchen activities, but that's, other things surprising? French. What's that? There's French. But it's pretty small. What's that? <laughs> So, okay, anything missing you would expect to be here? Robots. Robots, okay. That's a good one. Computers, okay. From Alan. Alan and I used to work together at Park years ago. So. Uh, Computers are just, they're so pervasive, they're like oxygen. Mm -hmm. yeah, there was Project Oxygen at MIT years ago. So, I, I, I'll, I'll say the things, uh, is Yoshi here somewhere? Um, so I think privacy, you see way down in the corner there is privacy. Think of having sensors everywhere and not having good privacy affordances, right? Big deal. Big deal when it comes to products, at least. You know, researchers can kind of, you know, close their eyes and not worry about it. But what, uh, anything else? I expect it to be more social stuff in here, social group, team, you know, things like that. Well, I think ubiquitous computing is, is interesting for an individual, but I think it's very interesting for teams of people, groups of people, a family, you know, work group, whatever. Any other things step, jump out at you? Okay. 
So what are we going to do about this, this ubiquitous world? Well, so we're, you know, the mission of our center um, is to you know, create systems that are richly aware of the context of, of, of people and their activities um, and, and continually learning and adapting to users and, and the, the space that they're in. Uh, we created three themes. We'll talk more about them in a bit. Uh, low power sensing and communication, which if you have any questions about that area, Josh Smith is right there. He's the man. Uh, understanding human state and activities. Some people would call this context-aware computing, uh, but I think this is a nice description of, of understanding people and what they do, and particularly doing some very fine-grained context work here, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then taking, um, you know, so doing sensing, creating, turning sensing into understanding, and then creating systems that are better for people out of that understanding. Okay, that's our, our basic flow. Uh, now, now you may, I'm not sure if you can see this very well. Um, I mentioned that we're trying to, in the, in the business of pulling together, together communities. And I think there's sort of two major communities and several smaller ones, but groups of folks who didn't tend to go to the same conferences, didn't tend to talk all that much. So I think you have sort of the AI world, where you know, Dieter has lived historically, you know, the vision, perception folks. And you had the Ubicomp, pervasive, you know, HCI community, uh, and also some, some deeper sensing folks, census and, and those kind of places, and, and some mobility uh, and low power computing work. And I think what we've tried to do is to pull these communities together a bit and really created a, a new community, if you will, uh, around you know, this center that really takes and tries to merge this, this body of work in these communities. And we're doing that by creating a set of scenarios uh, that we're focusing the center on. So, uh, and largely these are applications of, of what Dieter tends to call smart spaces. And smart space is a very broad term for us here. This is not like, um, you know, it has to be, uh, like this room, does, it doesn't have to be in a room like this. It doesn't have to be a particular place. It could be a portable smart space that goes around with you or a wearable smart space. So, you know, the area around you as you have your smartphone, uh, you know, is a, uh, is, is a certain kind of smart space. And um, we're talking about the privacy issues, I think, of Mitt Romney uh, in the 47% comment, uh, you know, there was, a, uh, there was a smart space around Mitt Romney. He just didn't know it uh, in that particular day. So. Okay, so anyway, we'll talk about, so what kinds of applications are we talking about? Well, so first, I think we have the notion of on-the-go smart spaces, you know, things that move with you. You know, you have a wearable computing. You have, you know, computing that's in your pocket. Uh, and that creates a space around you. And, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with that. And there's some very interesting things you can do with the interaction of, of various people's smart, smartphones and so forth in the space. Your, your smart space and my smart, smart space interacting. But this particular program is about helping health and well-being of people who are carrying uh, you know, mobile computing, smart, uh, smartphones, et cetera. Uh, we also have a focus of in the home, in a space that you particularly care about. And some very interesting work, I don't know if, if Schwedek is here, but, but Schwedek and, and team and, and Schwedek students are, are doing a bunch of work about creating uh, sensing in the home uh, with very simple sensing and creating, adding learning to that to be able to understand some very interesting things about the home, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And then there's the very deep uh, uh, you know, uh, instrumentation of a space, of a workspace, uh, you know, a kitchen counter, uh, a lab bench, you know, somewhere where something, you, know, you really want to know great gory detail what's going on in this particular space. And I think that's a nice um, way to think. So we have these different lenses that we're looking at, at this set of problems in. You know, out there in the wild, you know, in a particular larger space like a home or an office building or a mall or whatever, and then you know, very specific instrumented spaces. And we're hoping that by looking through these different lenses, we'll be able to learn a bunch of things about the algorithms, about uh, how people uh, live, work, and play, uh, and then we'll be able to do some interesting work there. Any questions on that? OK. No questions like, why did you pick those? That's what, that's what I would ask, but did I hear that? OK. All right, so I want to kind of jump back into the research themes a little bit and just kind of give you a, a little bit more overview. Um, and again, like I said, low power, sensing, and communications. Josh is the man. Uh, you should go see Josh's lab sometime if you haven't been through there. There's some cool stuff in there, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures of some of the stuff in, in Josh's lab in a minute. Um, but a lot of this is about um, being able to do sensing where there isn't power available necessarily. You know, very low power, sprinkle sensors out there and they just work forever and ever. You know, it could be grabbing energy from solar, from vibration, um, from RF, 
uh, but being able to harvest energy from various sources. And Josh even has, uh, some, well, I'll, I'll show you this stuff in a minute, some other interesting ways. And also just kind of designing with power in mind, both on the sensing side and also on the communication side. Um, and uh, uh, Josh and team are using a lot of backscatter types of techniques where you're, where you're just reflecting power off of something like akin to an RFID reader and to be able to understand, you know, be able to communicate the other direction and a few interesting low power protocols and such. Um, understanding human state and activities, I think we talked about this a little bit, but this is being able to understand at a very fine detail what somebody's doing. And, um, and the interesting thing here is if you combine various kinds of sensing, uh, you can learn a great deal about about something. So combining different kinds of sensing in Luke uh, is, is doing that in a space where he's adding uh, sort of natural language processing into some visual stuff to be able to combine those things and you can learn a lot more about an environment. Um, let me ask you a question. So I, I guess there, there's some very interesting ways to merge sensing and fuse sensing. So um, how, how, what would be the, the easiest way to tell your location right now for somebody who wanted to find out your location? Yes. Okay, so cell, GPS, yeah. Track four square. Track four square, sure. Those are, by the way, those are very different, that's a good set of examples. Those are very different ways of finding out where, where people are, right? How do you merge, how do you merge something that's that disparate, you know, from a very low level sensor, GPS sensor that's in your phone, and something that's, that's up in the cloud that's about you? You know, my calendar right now says I'm standing in this room, right? That's another place. You know, so there's all these different kinds of, how do you put you know, sensing together in ways that you're able to understand something about a person that's going to be useful to them or useful to others? So, and a lot of what this, not only are we worrying about fusing various kinds of sensing, but also uh, there's a deep body of work here about the algorithms to extract understanding from, uh, from uh, vision and so forth. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, finally, uh, a lot of this stuff's about uh, learning environments. Uh, and uh, machine learning, and I know a lot of you are into machine learning, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the students here. Uh, being able to, to learn continuously about users from all the sensing, bringing it up and using it in interesting ways, putting it together in interesting ways, uh, and, but in, in particular, adapting to the needs of a user and personalizing uh, to the needs of a user or, or a set of users. I want to just buzz through a few highlights from the center. And now, now I'm really talking about some details here that uh, you know, if you have questions on, we'll call on the folks who did the real work. So first, we we'll to talk about Josh and team's work. And uh, I meant, remember I mentioned we're trying to steal energy from a bunch of places. So here's some energy stealing uh, techniques that, that, now this piece of work actually was done in the Intel Lablet uh, before it uh, went away. And, uh, and this was uh, taking an RFID reader. Now, you get, you get, folks know how RFID works? Not, it has basically, you shoot power at a passive uh, antenna that, or, that has, uh, you know, an ID on it. And to a large extent, it, gets, it reflects back, essentially, the, you know, its ID. Um, so Josh and David Weatherall and team came up with this idea of stealing some of the power from it, also using some of the same techniques uh, for backscatter. And... Um, but they called this the, the WISP platform. And Josh, you want to add anything? Am I uh, explaining it well enough? Nope, but we added sensors to it. That's right, so powered some sensors through by stealing some of the power from the RFID readers. It was, you know, so as you got nearby the RFID reader, you basically were creating a, a sensor that could do interesting things. Um, so they've taken some of this, these ideas to a next level by stealing power from other places now. Uh, so they're stealing power from the TV signals, from the cellular signals, and also uh, doing some networking techniques to try and do low power uh, networking and be able to communicate. Now this is the one that I think is, uh, to me, the most far out. Um, and this is uh, stealing power from the changes in barometric pressure. And, uh, and so, uh, I, do I have the numbers right? It's still like 70 microjoules a day is kind of your number, or are you about right? Well, they usually tend to millo, but yeah. Oh, millijoules, I'm sorry. No, but micro is the right. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Um, apologies for that. So this is a typical, Josh is an inventor, and, uh, and what Josh um, and crew often do is kind of find an interesting place to go steal a, a part from, and, 
And what they did, this is a, a one, it's like one of those atomic clocks, is that right? That was, uh, and so th that, that kept the pressure, uh, you know, steady as best it could. So they're coming up with interesting ways of stealing power. All right, so in-home activity recognition, another uh, piece of work that's a combination of what Schwedek is up to and also Gregory About at, uh, at Georgia Tech. And this particular study was done um, in the Georgia Tech Aware Home that I'll tell you about in a minute. And the study is, um, uh, the, so what these guys have done is with one sensor be able to tell a great deal about what's going on in a home. So understanding and using machine learning, understanding putting one sensor on the water system, one sensor on the electrical system. They can tell all kinds of interesting things what are happening, what's happening in the house. And um, so what they did was they took, uh, at the wear home, they ran through uh, about 30 people doing a bunch of different interesting things in, in using the water system in the house over a several week period. They, they tried to split it between different you know, categories of folks and all that. And the interesting thing they were able to do, just with water alone, was to get uh, about better than 70% recognition of what people are doing inside a, inside a space. Now, that, this is an amazing result, I think. If you look at certain things, so if you take a look at like, like flushing a toilet um, or doing the dishes in the kitchen, they can get extremely good, 90% plus kind of numbers to understand what people are up to. And you know, of course, you say, well, why do I care? Well, you know, if you're trying to, uh, you know, if your, your grandmother's living in this house and you want to make sure she's okay and and so forth and so on, those kinds of things, right? But, but there's some places where there's still a lot of confusion. For example, um, if you're in the kitchen and uh, washing your hands or pour, pouring yourself a glass of water, from the water system, you really can't tell much difference between those things. They look a lot, and the, the water runs for 20 seconds and then it stops. And it's very hard to tell those things apart. But if you had you know, other kinds of you know, recognition capabilities you know, added to another sensor, so all of a sudden you can drive that number you know, much higher by adding another modality. Yeah? What does this sensor look like in this case? Uh, uh, somebody here from Schwedig's team? OK. Oh, Eric, yeah. Uh, it's, just, it's just a pressure sensor that's basically hooked up to a Wi-Fi ADC. It's pretty simple. You look it screws yeah. onto the faucet, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it screws onto the, the faucet. Or you can put it underneath the kitchen sink or, or on an outside hose figure. Basically, this is an extraordinary result, I think. I think the learning techniques and the stuff you guys have done, and, but in, and there's a similar set of results for the electrical system. They can go and look at you know, the electrical system in a home in the same way. So you might want to talk, that's Eric Larson up there, if you might want to talk to those guys, you want to find out more. So other questions? Okay. All right. Um, now I'm going to jump into the vision uh, part of this, and, and there's you know, some absolutely world-class vision folks. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but there's some absolutely world-class vision people uh, in your midst. And uh, if you, this is an area you want to find out more about, you know, Dieter Fox, Zhao Feng Ren, and Li Feng Bo, who are the Intel folks on campus. Uh, you know, extraordinary, extraordinary folks right here for you to talk to if you want to find out more. So um, first of all, uh, there's now some, some cameras available, particularly the depth cameras that, you know, Connect uses and such, but those style of cameras that all of a sudden a whole new uh, type of data is available to us that wasn't available before. And uh, using depth cameras, occasionally using um, uh, egocentric cameras, you know, wearable cameras, uh, there's some interesting results we can get, and we'll, sh we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so, so this is actually a, uh, this picture right here on, on your left is the uh, is picture, look, just a fixed camera uh, in a kitchen. Uh, so that was in the wear home, and being able to watch what people are doing. And the stuff on the right is, is the depth. That's right, that's the depth stuff, Xiaofeng, yeah. So that's the depth view. And be able to combine those things together. And at the same time, you could, we, we also did, ran some experiments with egocentric version of this web, that is uh, you know, tracking people's gaze and so forth and so on. And, be, and there's you know, very deep insights. As I mentioned, you know, Luke uh, here is, is adding uh, natural language processing of speech as well. So you can now figure out a bunch of interesting things. And I'll show you some videos of this in a, in a minute or two. So first, um, what kinds of things we'll be able to do? This is with the depth camera work. And this is absolutely world-class stuff. Uh, there's you know, a handful of folks in the world who are doing work like this who, who have gotten these kinds of results. Uh, so being able to understand what kinds of objects are in a space, that's not that hard, right? Some good work there, but it's not that hard. What state they're in, um, what actions are being performed on the objects. Now you're starting to get to something that's much more difficult. 
Um, and then what, what steps we are in some larger activity. So being able to so build up from the objects, activities, uh, all the way through to the activities and be able to, you know, are you following a typical recipe and so forth. And you have to be in a context. You have to understand the kitchens and, and have a knowledge base for kitchens and stuff to be able to do this. And what I'm going to show you now is uh, a video of this in flight. And this was from the Ubicon paper that uh, Dieter and Zhao Feng and their, uh, their student Jenna, is Jenna here? Uh, presented it at Ubicon. So, oops. All right. So, so you're going to see, notice that the system understands that's a cake, cake mix, that's a bowl, those are hands, you know, that's not part of, the, part of the cake mix, right? Oh, I just poured. Wow, that's pretty interesting. You're able to tell that you're pouring something. Okay, it recognizes a small bowl, recognizes, oh, another pouring motion, okay? So that device, that thing has a, has a pouring motion to it. Now, okay, I've got oil. Oh, I can pour oil. All right, it goes into this. Right, I can add this in, right? So imagine any kind of activity where you want to record, um, you know, whether it's a recipe, whether it's uh, working in a lab, whether it's fixing something, you know, uh, running a, uh, a maintenance task, uh, understanding what it is you just did, and, and uh, did I do it correctly, and recording it, and being able to train somebody with, uh, you know, because it understands, you know. One of the key things people always do is they forget how many spoonfuls of sugar or flour or whatever you put in. Well, um, think of that in a more complex task where you're in a biology lab or whatever. Um, you know, those kinds of things are very important in a space like this. So, so absolutely, as I said, world-class stuff here. Um, in addition, our colleague Jim Ray uh, at Georgia Tech uh, has uh, been working on some of the egocentric uh, vision stuff and uh, along with Zhao Feng and some other folks. And uh, this is the, you know, what's in my focal plane? What am I looking at? What am I doing with my hands and so forth? And I've got a little video of this to kind of show you the, give you the idea. There we go. So, so this is again with uh, Google Glass, if I, if I remember correctly, and um, able to track the device, know the difference between the, the, the thing you're working on and your hands, be able to do recognition tasks with this. And th these kinds of um, vision capabilities are very complementary to the kinds of things we can do with fixed cameras with the, with the um, uh, the, the three-dimensional cameras, depth cameras. Um, I'm kind of done with the, the research highlights here, and I just wanted to kind of wrap up, and then we can open it up for discussion and questions and such. So first thing, you know, we've created this center, uh, you know, at Cornell, Stanford, Rochester, Georgia Tech, and most importantly, UW, uh, combining with some Intel Labs folks across a number of communities. Um, we have three major themes. Uh, we're creating a a set of applications around smart spaces, all the way from you know, wearable smart spaces all the way to very you know, intense smart spaces and these different prisms we think will teach us something. And the idea is we think that uh, sort of as we go to the next generation of, of uh, systems, we think that you know, we're going to be able to sense uh, without you know, using a lot of a power, like from batteries and things that are plugged into the wall and so forth. Um, yeah, it is warm in here. You know, I can see people going like this. Yeah. Um, we're going to be able to sense uh, in, in unobtrusive fashions, for example, this incredible sensing structure that Schwedig and folks have put together, uh, being able to sense in a home uh, you know, with, with just one sensor and learning a great deal about things, the ability to fuse sensors of various kinds. Right? Um, we're going to be able to, you know, systems will be able to have a deep understanding of where they're embedded, where they're, where they're being used, who's using them, how they're being used, all the context around them. Uh, be able to learn, learn in very deep ways about new objects, tasks, activities, uh, the context that you're in and so forth. Be able to guide people through complex tasks. This is a very important set of things. You think about all the training applications and the uh, things you can capture this way. Uh, and interact, of course, via you know, various kinds of rich human input. And finally, if we think that this is going to get instantiated in all kinds of smart space environments uh, everywhere. And with that, I'm done. And I'm happy to take questions in the chat. James. Uh, James. Um, so kind of the field of uh, UBCOM has been around for over 20 years. And it's really riddled with a lot of research projects that are very, what I would call, technology-centered, technology push, and don't solve real problems. And therefore, create technologies that 
aren't necessary, not necessary because they don't come out of any real user need. Classic one I showed in my class this morning is the smart fridge, which you know comes around okay. every couple really of years telling us, you know, and I'm out of milk, buy me some eggs, you know, problems right. that I don't really seem to have. <laughs> Maybe my wife will say that's because she takes care of it. But, um, <laughs> but, but what I didn't see in the talk was a user story in terms of real applications that you guys are attacking, that you studied in a way to know that they're valid in some way that would lead to the technology being appropriate. For example, there's this assumption, it seems like, that we're going to wear cameras everywhere. And you know, although we've had that since you know 1945 on the cover of Atlantic Monthly with um, with Vanny Bush, you know, um, <coughs> other than some guys snowboarding and stuff, you don't really see most people wearing it. And you know, Google has this vision maybe that we will in our glasses, but it's unclear whether people do that. It, it, is is vision like this major assumption, and is it coming out of any real idea of what people will really want to do? Um, I got a couple different ways I could think of answering that. Uh, I think we do have, I didn't focus it on, on it in this talk, but we do have a number of guiding visions for each of those, those sub-applications. So for example, the uh, OpenM health stuff is really about he health and well-being, and they're starting from a health and well-being foundation about what, you know, what people need. Their, you know, so Deborah, you know Deborah, right? Deborah, Esther, and, and Tanzim are, are kind of focused there. Um, I think it's less true in some of the other projects, and we're a lot about building building blocks. And I think that's you know I think that's a place where we could do more uh, and better. But I will take a, a flip side for a second. Um, I think that the vision that Wiser put out um, is partially instantiated people's smartphones now. And I don't think I mean how many of you just out of curiosity how many of you would give up your smartphone? Okay, one or two. Okay, yeah, I mean, maybe right. But I, think, but I think, you know, until the affordances show up, I mean, and somebody does a great job like Apple's done and, and other folks, um, you don't always know, you know, all the usages are going to drive as these technologies progress. And I think putting together, I think, you know, putting together uh, good usage models and testing them out and trying them out, I think is a great thing. And I think it's one of the things that we're, we are doing some of. I don't know, Dieter, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think on the one hand side, yeah, we're still looking at the, in a sense, the basic building blocks. How do you do this kind of fine-grained activity recognition? Applications are also, for example, Henry Couch has been looking a long, a long time at kind of helping elderly people in their home, keeping track of their activities. Um, another thing we, we want to maybe add in the next year, yep. because, for example, there's a smart kitchen a scenario that we have in here. Some people love it. Other people say, well, that's just kind of playing around with stuff that nobody really wants. Um, but uh, we're going to add another scenario, for example, with Eric Levins most likely doing wet lab automation where you're doing experimentation in a bio wet lab and how do you keep track of the procedures there. And people have tried these kind of things, but I think now with better technology we can make real progress. And, and so in, fact, in fact, using in this, those as sorry, application scenarios. In, in this particular case, the real problem is, so the way Eric described it to us, let me start back. So this was, there's a famous paper in his discipline where somebody went back and ran through 50 of the most important biological experiments done in the laboratory of the last, you know, however many years, and they ran 50 of these over again. And they were only able to reproduce seven of them. Okay, and the reason is because in their space, um, there's a lot of, of uh, uh, um, you know, all those procedures, all the things you do, oh no, you don't heat that all the way up to a boil, you, you know, you don't, add, oh, you know, you have to, pipetted a certain way, all that kind of stuff to get things to work. We're, you know, we're going to try and help them solve that repeatability problem, be able to you know, put that stuff. So there, there's a real problem in the sciences that we're going to try and attract, uh, uh, attack. Uh, when Caetano attacked it years ago, it was cool. Yep. It still is. But you just got to watch out that you don't end up doing, you know, find my lost toy or find my keys. That's like the smart <laughs> fridge. It's like a problem nobody has that you become researchers. Yeah, uh, Gaetano, go ahead. I your keys all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, how much would you pay for it? I'd like to go back to the smartphone comment. Yeah. So I think that's really a red herring in that it speaks to the, the choice of words we use, ubiquity and pervasiveness as being everywhere. But that was not really Mark's vision. I mean, that was a part of it, but it was coupled with fading into the background. 
Yeah, not interacting. The visibility. Yeah. Not interacting with the devices in a purposeful sure. way, and having it interrupt your your life. So I think we do have smartphones. They're everywhere with us, but boy, they require a lot of attention. Yeah, that's. <laughs> and so we we haven't done that a very good job of that part at all. So I I think you know an example of that you know might you know might be something more like well. Can these devices learn what my habits are and anticipate what I'm going to need? Uh, you know, we've been talking for many years about uh, sort of, you know, we have this traffic information, we have timing information about transportation, uh, and we know where we have to go and things like that, but we can't still warn someone that they better get going now because things are looking bad and they're going to take longer to get there. You know, we still don't have a good, reliable system for doing that. Okay. And I think that's more an example of what Mark was talking about with mm -hmm. having a conversation with your devices, having them help you do what you needed to do when you needed it, not, not to have to sit there and do 30 clicks to get that information. Well, and also, there's times when people, you, you try to provide those affordances, and if you get it wrong, it's very annoying to people, yeah. right? I mean, if you start saying, you better leave for the airport. You better leave for the airport. There's a traffic jam on, you know, on I-5. You better leave for the airport. Yeah. So, so for you, that maybe that would be exactly what you'd want, and it might drive Alan crazy, right? Exactly. So it has to learn what I look for when I go to the airport, right? Exactly. So understanding you in the context, that's, I mean, that's important. Yeah. And I get it. Yeah. I feel like a lot of this was being able to combine the computing resources of different places. Right? And then I think we, although we don't, are not completely there, we already have parts of it, such as One Muscle Weight. It uses things or sensors on various buses, and then it combines that information that we can just look up on our smartphone when we want to, and it's not constantly there. So I think that's one example that might illustrate this. <laughs> Is there a question in there? I'm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but for example, with one bus away again, it's like, well, I take one of six buses to get home. When I walk out of the building, it should tell me, hey, go to that bus stop, because that's going to be your price. Right. Well. Yeah. I should be able to glance down and just see that. That's a good map. That's Instead, a good map. <laughs> <laughs> That data that's there already, right? It's just yeah. not being packaged correctly. It's not learning what parts of that data I really want it's to get see. me home at. Yeah. There, there is some of that now in, in the new Android release, but I'm not right now. Okay. <laughs> And the, with one bus away, one of the problems was really also the reliance on the, the bus system providing you the location estimates from when the bus would arrive at a certain bus stop. And since the Seattle, the Sound Transit, they didn't use GPS on their buses yet, it was just pretty unreliable. And sometimes you would get there and it was already gone and estimates were off by three, four minutes. But, but we can but tell when everybody's smartphone gets on a bus. I agree, yep. People are looking at it. Yep. So couldn't we crowdsource all that information yep. automatically and have a more accurate system? But by the way, yeah. we're to a certain extent we're on the busiest quarter, but there is never high enough adoption to really get accurate results. But we do with one bus away. Right. So if you have that under the what's what the facts? Yes, I mean, um, Metro is replacing the older system, and eighty-five percent of the buses are now GPS. Yeah. It will be a hundred percent, you know, genuine. Oh, yeah, so this problem will go away. <laughs> but if you start to think about this arena, there are it's it's rife with opportunities, and I think to to James's point, I mean. I don't think we did a good job of calling out all the, the user opportunities, but there's a ton of them. I think, you know, and we're, in certain parts, we're doing some core technologies. And uh, James, you can help us think about some of the ones that, uh, you know, the things that we're missing. And in fact, I, I guess uh, one of the things I'll, I'll ask you to think about for a minute is, you know, what, what else do you think we're missing? And I'll get this gentleman's question. Go ahead, while you're thinking. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're doing with uh, privacy and security that you mentioned a couple of times. And I know that, uh, and then, like, for example, Shvetek system is being adopted like through the medium of the energy companies, right? Because they're the ones who, are, who can pay for these sensors and they're interested in the data, right? 
Um, and I know it's being fed back to people for people that group, but um, could you maybe talk about some of the, you know, what you see as the implications of this pervasive? Um, so so I, think, I think that, okay, so first of all, a few years ago in UB, the UbiComp community, pervasive community, there was a large contingent of folks you know, doing, there was workshops, there was, you know, folks focusing on privacy and ubiquitous computing. And my sense is that the, sort of, the energy went like this. Um, and I don't fully understand why. Maybe they thought they'd covered the problems and stuff. I think maybe it just, it got hard. You know, it was a pretty difficult set of things to address. Uh, if you, you see a new guy, Jason, Ho Jason Hong is one of those guys, right? Uh, like you're talking about, oh, you know, we just tie together all the smartphones and we have that data and we know, but, you know, it's, that's directly opposite to privacy is getting more data yeah. about everyone, right? Yeah. So I, I, think, I think that getting that right, in fact, uh, uh, James Fogarty is at, uh, at WIS this week, but James uh, and several of his students were probably with him, uh, and also Yoshi Kono and some of his students are thinking about um, making affordances for users so they can control how much they share and, and how private things will be and all that. And that, that's probably the best we're going to be able to do to, to get Gaetano's conversation before where Alan and Gaetano are going to have very different views. You know, I, uh, you guys, some of the people who are, say, under 25 or under 30 in this room probably have very different views of privacy than maybe, you know, somebody like, like me does. Uh, you know, I have kids about your age, and, and they certainly have a different view of what they're willing to put out on a Facebook page versus what, you know, I'm willing to put out on a Facebook page, right? Uh, so, yeah, Alan. It seems like these technologies have a lot of potential for uh, making things more accessible for blind people and others. Yep. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, do, you want, do you want to say something? you want to respond to that one? Oh, I, well, I haven't worked in this area. I'm just one of the students. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so, so Richard's part of our center. And I would turn to Richard. I, Dieter, can you? So we've been talking to Richard a lot. And, um, we're looking at things like if you could recognize objects in a room, right, and then you could guide the person, for example, for where the bridge is and things like that, if it's a room there where they haven't been before. But on the other hand, it also seems that technology people are often very naive about how they could help blind people, and Richard kind of guides us in the direction of, of not coming up with crazy ideas. For example, I would have thought it would be great if, for blind people, if you could guide them through a building like the Allen Center, but he said that they're actually very good at, at walking through such a building because they can, for example, sense when there's a hallway on the right side, they just sense it through the airflow and through the acoustics. So uh, yeah, we, we're talking a lot to Richard about those issues. Okay, uh, Enrique. Yeah, um, going back to the other discussion on kind of the, uh, the, the history and the purpose of kind of pervasive computing, I mean, you know, at the time that Mark Weiser wrote his paper, we were all visiting uh, computer graphics labs and, and these things called caves, right, where you went in and you put on goggles and you went into these spaces. Yeah. And in many ways, uh, ubiquitous computing was viewed as the antidote to virtual reality. Right? You'd go into these spaces and, ah, I forgot my X, Y, Z. And there was this whole notion that, you know, you shouldn't have to remember things and create them in your virtual world. They should be available everywhere you are. And, and if they really are everywhere you are, then I guess there's this notion that you have to think about them not just from an infrastructure perspective, but they really have to disappear completely. And I was curious as to how far you're thinking of pushing the research and promoting the research at, at the U relative to really supporting their completely disappearing into the, uh, into the entire infrastructure and, and making them truly pervasive. And then the other question was, but one at a time. So I think the, the, on, the, on that vector, I think of Josh's work where you're trying to make things just powered by the environment. So that's one spot where you know, sensing can be everywhere. It can be built in, it can be painted into walls. It can be built into buildings. It can be sprinkled in the grass. It can, you know, it can be everywhere. So I think that making sensing you know, just every place and cheap and you know, not having to have batteries everywhere and filling up landfills and all that stuff. I mean, so that's, that's one small vector that I think we're working on. Um, I, I, but I don't, I, don't think, I don't think we're you know, totally pushing at that, at that part of the envelope that I can think of. Dieter, you want to? Anything. Well, you mentioned also much more natural interfaces like the speech language interfaces, right? So that you can just yeah. talk yep. to your environment. And many people have seen Siri and, and have fun with it mostly, I guess. But I guess if at <laughs> some point you can make these kind of systems really work, it will be a big step forward. Yeah, so it, uh, what, what are we, like, like what James was saying, what, what are we missing? What should we be doing, you think, that we're not doing? We can't afford, aren't able to do everything, of course, but yeah. So, like, if if this pervasive thing ever takes off, 
<laughs> Again, how many smartphones in the audience? How many, how many sensors are in this room right now? Just out of curiosity, so how many smartphones multiply by six or eight for each sensor? Sensor, you know, these are cameras. There's a lot of sensors. So I, I think we're, there's certainly, you know, the number of sensors in the universe is going like this. Now, now we've got to figure out what to do with them. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. I mean, like, more like we were talking about fading into, like, disappearing completely. Yes. What happens if, like, something goes wrong and you have to fix it, or how do you find all of those sensors efficiently to fix them and stuff? Um, so the, the sensor folks, some other sensor folks I know who are doing work in this space um, are worried about, they make sure that there's enough robustness. You know, if there's a, a thousand sensors sprinkled around, they don't care if only 20 survive in an environment to be able to get enough information. Because they're really cheap, they're so cheap, they're painted into the walls. Who cares if half of them die, you know, in the next 10 years, as long as half of them are still working. So that's, pro I mean, that's maybe not a good answer to your question. But, but I, if they're cheap enough, you know, you sprinkle some more. Yes, Rick? In the computer vision work, in the object recognition, it should work toward a noisier environment. So my kitchen is not as clean as I assume that was Dieter's kitchen. <laughs> actually, it's a desk here, actually, but yeah. We have junk all over the counter, some stuff that's there all the time, but some things that people keep putting things on the counter in my house. I don't know why. Yeah, us too. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a lot harder than what Jinda was doing. So, Dieter, you, you're the... No, I, I think that's actually a great point, but that's what's uh, bringing up the interesting research questions for computer vision, right? Like, how do you track things like sugar or, or spinach? If you chop it up, then suddenly it looks totally different. And I think we can do a lot of work kind of tracking things over time and seeing how it changes. And then take advantage also of kind of the user interaction. So if the system doesn't know what it is, the user might just say what it is. Right? And so of course, okay, that's the spinach here in the recipe. And what's the difference between right some sugar and so some salt in a bowl? You know, they probably look pretty similar. Right? Yeah. So it's an opportunity for research. Anyway, okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you.